And I'll tell you where I got my uh, inspiration for today. I don't watch a lot of TV, but I, I tell you something that always sucks me in are these shows about prison. I don't know why. I, I, they had that one that was like called 60 Days In, maybe, and these people, they choose. They're perfectly innocent folks, but they choose to go to jail for 60 days because they want to see what it's like to be in jail. And I watch that, and I, every time I watch like on the Justice Channel, they'll show these different jails. And I really hate to watch it because it makes me so nervous. I, I'm not a tight person. I, I, like I said, I don't like people. I don't like to be confined in spaces. <laughs> Jail is not for me. I'm telling you, I, I'll near about have a panic attack when I watch these shows, but yet every time I come across one, I've got to watch the show. And I was watching one. It's been several months ago. Um, and I'll never forget it because it, it seems so strange to me. It was a maximum security prison. And apparently what had happened was they had a, a group of people that was transferred from several smaller prisons into this maximum security prison to serve out you know, the remainder of their time or they had just been sentenced or what have you. And they were sitting in a room, you know, maybe half this size, probably 20 or 30 guys in there, and a correction officer was standing in front of them, and he, he came up and he approached them and he said, Good morning, I'm Correction Officer Smith, and I'm here to see that you get the most out of your time at this prison facility. And I thought that was odd. He was going to make sure they get the most out of their time. But after that, he proceeded to show them. They had like a woodworking shop in this prison. These guys were going to be here the rest of their life. Um, and they had a wood shop where they built furniture. And he told them about how they could become part of this wood shop. And they had a, a, a machine shop where they could make things. Hopefully not shanks. That wouldn't be good. But uh, <laughs> they, they, they could make machine. They were trying to teach these guys skills that were life skills, that were valuable skills. And I sat there and as I watched that, I said, you know, that there's a lot of truth in what he just said that applies to our life in that small sentence. So I'd like to start today by saying that to you. I'd like to say, good morning. I'm Nathan Lumpkin, and I'm here to see that you get the most out of your time at Bayou Tala Fellowship. That's what our church, uh, that's what our, our message is going to be about this morning. Like I said, I'm, I'm a task oriented person. It's easy to keep track with me. I got to speak fast because I was reading over this yesterday. And I have got an abundance of stuff that I've wrote down over the last two or three weeks since Justice uh, asked me to speak. So you may just want to write down real fast. You may want to look at it later. It is easy to follow one, two, three, four steps. You know, it'll be real easy for you to keep up with, but it is going to have to move on kind of quickly. So um, dude, these dadgum cords, I feel like I'm in an ICU or something. I've got every little box and cords running here and there. It drives me crazy. Um, but number one, let's get into this. Number one, the first thing we need to do if we're here to get the most, not just to be seat fillers, not just to be disgruntled church members, if we want to get the most, the absolute most out of the time that we have at Bayou Tala Fellowship, the first thing we got to do, and let me say this before I say number one, I tricked you. I realize that maybe some of you, this is not your home church. Maybe you're visiting with a friend today and you've got another church that you'll be back where you're a member at next week. That's fine. Just apply this to your church. It's the same. If you're looking for a church and you're just visiting with us today and you don't plan to be here next week, that's fine. When you settle down into that church that you're going to call your home church, apply these steps. This applies to church in general, not just us here at Bayou Tala. But the first thing you need to do, if you want to be fulfilled in your church experience, the first thing you got to do is show up. It's a simple concept. My sister graduated. She, uh, she did two years at a local community college and then she went on to a university and I went to the graduation ceremony from the community college and they had a guest speaker who was a local businessman in town and his whole message was about that. And I don't really go to many graduations, but I would expect that's the typical type message you get. And he was speaking about showing up. And he talked how he hired this girl. And he thought this girl was the next big thing. She was going to come in and run this business. She had all the experience that anybody could ever need. She was just the perfect, most likable person. And the first day of the job, he's there to meet her and she wasn't there. And he called her and she didn't answer the phone. Now, I don't know what happened, but she didn't show up. So it doesn't matter how good she could have been, she never showed up to find out. If we're going to get the most out of church, the first thing we've got to do is show up. You know, there, there's people that don't nobody take offense to me. I realize I come across blunt sometimes. I don't know you guys enough to speak directly to you, but there's a lot of people that I've encountered in my life and in my church experience that they like to complain about things that are going on at the church, but they're not even here most of the time. You know, I, I told my guys I was in management for seven years before I took my current job, and I would tell my guys all the time, don't approach me with a problem 
unless you also can approach me with a solution. Because if you just point out the problem, you're just complaining. I don't need any more complaining. I'm a grown babysitter as a manager, basically, to hear everybody's problems. So let's bring forth solutions, but we got to show up. But that'd be like you got the invite to a party. You didn't go to the party, but the next day when everybody came back to work or whatever, everybody was talking about the party, and you talked about how crummy it is. It doesn't work that way, guys. If we're going to get something out of church, we've got to show up to church. We have to make it a, a habit to be here at church. That's what Justice said last week. You know, He said, if it's Sunday, his family's going to be at church. That's what they do. Um, and it needs to be that way that your family knows today is the day that we're going to be in church. You've got to show up for church. We've got one of these boxes that's on me, I believe, is to do a podcast. Uh, it'll be played to where people that can't be here can watch. I know sometimes they put the services on Facebook. Those are things we offer at church. That's a good thing. That's a supplemental thing. But it doesn't replace the fact that we need to be here inside these four walls at church. Um, I read a quote the other day when I was looking about something about showing up, and it says, success is what happens when you stumble on an opportunity and you're 100% there to catch it. I love that, guys. You, know, you never know th that fulfillment that you needed, that word that you needed that would have gave you the most experience out of your time here at church might have came on the day you weren't here to catch it. That opportunity may have been presented today and somebody decided to stay home today and they're not going to get that opportunity. Um, if you want to turn with me, we'll be there for just a minute in Hebrews. It's not a new scripture, but it definitely uh, makes this point very well and, and easy to understand. Wait, Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 23. It says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised it is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as it is the manner of some. This was a letter wrote to the Hebrew people uh, as their church, and apparently they had got to where some of them didn't like to come together. They didn't like to come to church. They had other things more important to do than coming to church. And they were saying... You need to be there. Don't neglect it. It's important for you to be at church. So number one, if you want to ensure that you get the most out of your time, you got to show up. Number two, we're going to read in that same passage. And what it says after, it says, don't neglect coming. It says, but exhort one another and so much the more as you see the day appro uh, approaching. Exhort one another and so much more. The, that that kind of leads me to say that we got to exhort, and there's other things on top of that that we do when we assemble. And I, I kind of got to thinking about it, and I said, well, what, what does that have to do with anything else? So number two, if you're writing down, I'm going to say the number two thing we need to do to be fulfilled at church is to inspire and to encourage, to exhort one another. It, it says in the Scripture that your tongue has the power of life and death. When people come in the door, see, that's the thing you don't get from the podcast. You don't get that person that shakes your hand. I told David this morning, I was walking in and out to go see my wife and my little boy, and I walked in and out three or four times, and he shook my hand every time he came in the door. I said, man, I'm just going to keep coming in and out just to act like i got a friend here, you know? But that, you don't get that. You can hear this message for sure when you listen to it on the internet, but you don't get that exhortation. You don't walk in and somebody says, man, I heard somebody tell uh, Mr. Roy this morning, Roy, that shirt makes you, you look great in that blue shirt. You look sharp. You don't get that over the internet. So when we come, we need to be a people that exhort and so much more. I, I got another passage I'd like to read to you. Um, it's going to take a little while. So it's a, you know, like a whole chapter, but I had never read it and really... I don't guess, kind of fully understood it. It's in chapter, uh, Luke chapter 8. And when I did read it, I really liked it. And I was going to maybe not share it, but I don't, I don't know. I think we're going to. We'll just be late to the buffet, I guess. So... It, that's two things I listed there. I said we're going to inspire and we're going to encourage. To inspire, we can do things. We can point out the best in other people. We choose to speak life. We, 
we see what they're good at and we let them know they're good at it. Uh, just like Anthony did. He said, Darren, you did a good job. You're good at it. We're exhorting people. You know, it's crazy that when we do that to other people, it makes us feel better about ourselves. We, we get something from giving that to other people. So one thing we need to make sure is that when we're here, that we are doing. We're pointing out that thing. We're, we're speaking life to people. And the other thing is to encourage. And that's why I want to read this passage of Scripture to you. Is David said something a few weeks back when uh, Justice was out last. And... I, I don't know. I don't, I don't guess it was like just the best revelation I've ever heard in my life, but it's, it just hasn't stopped churning in my head. He was talking about how the, the word of our testimony has power. And he, he said that he was uh, listening where somebody had, had been ill and they got better and they were telling him about how they came through it. And he was so blessed. It didn't happen to David. He said he was no part of it. But by the word of their testimony, it changed David. He got something from that. And I was reading about this. Uh, that's where I said we're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 8. It's kind of a story about what the, the testimony can do. Let's see. Look at about verse 26. All right, I'll, I'll go back. You can stay on 26, but let me tell you. Okay, it said, Then he arose, this is Jesus, and he rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased. And there was a calm. But he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, but marveled, saying to another, Who can you be? For he commands even the winds and water to obey him. Okay, so here's Jesus. He calms the sea. Now we step on down to the next thing. This all seems to me to be in order the way I read this. So that happens. And it says, then. So there again, that's what I take. He calms the waves. Then, immediately following, this happens. Then they sailed to the country of Gardenes, which is opposite of Galilee. And when he stepped out to the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he had no clothes, and he didn't live in a house, but in tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and in a loud voice he said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had often seized him. And he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. And Jesus said, What is your name? And this is the demon speaking through the man. He said, Legion, because many demons have entered him. And they begged him, and he would not command them to go out of the abyss. Now a herd of many swine were feeding in the mountain. So they begged him that he would permit them to enter them. And he permitted them. So here's the man full of demons, several demons. They said, don't just make us leave. They knew that Jesus was getting rid of them. They said, let us have somewhere to go. So they said, can we just go enter in these pigs and possess pigs? And he said, I'll grant you that one thing. So chapter uh, verse 33 says, then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. When those who fed them saw what happened, they fled and told in the city and the country. Then they went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found a man whom the demons had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. They also, who had seen it, told them by what means he who had been demon-possessed was healed. Then the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the gardeners asked him to depart. This is Jesus. They, they, they said, look, this guy had some sketchy stuff going on. You, had, you got rid of it. And we're kind of scared about it. You know, we don't know what happened here, but we're unsure. They said, maybe you need to ease on away from here. And it says, then the, let's see, then the whole multitude surrounded, asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. And he got into the boat and returned. Now the man who was, whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. So the demon-possessed man said, Jesus, you're leaving. Let me go. And Jesus sent him away saying, return to your own house. And this is the kicker here, church. And tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Mine breaks this up, but it goes into verse 40 and it says, So it was when Jesus returned, so it said he left. When he returned, the multitude welcomed him. That's the testimony I'm talking about, church. They were scared of Jesus. They said, Jesus, we don't want any part of you, dude. We don't know what you're doing, but it's freaky. You need to leave. And he left. 
but the testimony of this man. This man shared who Jesus was. He shared what happened. And the same people that just asked him to leave when he came back said, Jesus, come on by, buddy. Let's hang out. Because the word of one man's testimony, church, you don't get that unless you're in church. If you want to get the most out of church, we need to do that. We can encourage and we can inspire and we need to share our testimony with each other. When, when the Lord does something for you on Friday, there's no need to keep it to yourself. Come here on Sunday and tell your folks about it. Say, this is what Jesus has done for me because it will encourage them in their walk. They may say, you know what? You said the Lord just handled paying a bill that you couldn't pay and I'm in the same situation, but I've got faith now because if he did it for you, he'll do it for me. So if we're going to get the most out of our service, we need to inspire and encourage the people around us. Those are some ways to do it. Number three, if we want to get the most out of our time in church, we need to have proper expectations. This is something the Lord showed me, I don't know, maybe two years ago. It just very clearly, He spoke to me. Proper expectations. As He said, too many people come to church seeking a presentation and not a revelation. See, I said this to a church, I don't know, we may have had 50 people there, and I'm telling you, I thought they were leaving. And I don't think this is offensive. But I said, if you come to this church because you like to hear Darren sing, you're going to leave this church because of the way Darren sings. If you come because you like to hear Justice preach, you're going to leave because of the way Justice preaches. If you come because you like the coffee, you'll leave because of the coffee. See, we've got to make church about more than what we can get when we get there. We, we don't need to seek presentation. We don't need to be sitting here as a member watching a concert, but we need to come seeking revelation. We need to come with an expectation, church. That's why I said proper expectations when we come. But it doesn't need to be the expectation of, I want to hear this song and this song and this song because that's what gets me all in my feels and I can go home thinking I've done something right. But our expectation needs to be proper to where we come where we're looking for a revelation. I, this was something after the fact, so I got it on a little sticky note. Lord, I probably forgot something I wanted to tell you. Um, but you say, okay, well, how do, we, how do we get these revelations? What do you mean to have proper uh, to have proper expectation, to have the expectation of coming here and receiving a revelation. In Matthew 7, 7, I'm not going to go there, but it says, ask, and it will be given to you. And I said, okay, well, that's a good starting point. Ask. When we're coming, that's part of the expectation we have. Before you leave your house on Sunday morning, ask. Say, Lord, I ask you that in my time when I'm in church, Lord, just show me something. Speak a little word to me. Just give me something that I didn't have before. Ask. But then when I tell you what I like about after it, it says, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. So see, that leads me to think that asking is a good starting point, but you don't just say, Lord, give me a revelation. I'm out of here. It says, seek. After you ask, seek. That's what Anthony said this morning. He said he doesn't know how to meditate. And see, I, me not being a people person, I got a lot of alone time, and that's what I do. If I'm looking at stuff for a message, I just roll it over and over my head and say, Lord, what is this saying? Please show me what this means. I'll focus on one scripture and I'll think about that scripture over and over. I'm seeking, I'm looking to find answers. It says, ask and it'll be given. Seek, and you will find. If you want to find a revelation, be seeking of that revelation. And it says, knock, and those doors will be open to you. So the first thing we need to do is we need to ask for revelation. We need to start to, to, to start our mornings and our times that, that we spend with the Lord by asking Him to show us something. And then we need to start doing some of our own work and start seeking these things out. If there's a truth that we don't understand, we need to look at that truth and see what we can find about it. And the third thing is with proper expectations is that we do have to have an expectation of this revelation. If you look back, uh, I'll give you the reference, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 8. If you want to look that up, that was uh, about the prophet Elijah. And it said that God Himself, Almighty God, this is Old Testament, you know, and God would present Himself to people uh, like He did Moses and, and Elijah here and so many others. And He presented Himself to Elijah. And it said when He came in, He was like a wind. And it tore down and parted mountains. But God wasn't there. 
He said, then an earthquake came and the earth broke apart and fell to pieces and God wasn't in the earthquake. And then a great fire came and it consumed all the land and God wasn't in the great fire. See, if you think about God Almighty speaking, that's what you think about. Big production, boom, this is happening. Like the Ten Commandments and the veils torn and the whole nine, but it said He wasn't in any of that. He said, but then a still small voice came. And that's where he found God in a still small voice. So you've got to be expecting it, church. I was talking to Nestor this morning, um, and I, I was thinking about this yesterday, actually. All my hobbies are the same. With this, this expectation really means something. I really understand it because of the hobbies that I have. And, you know, me and a buddy of mine got into competitive shooting some years ago, and we went into it saying, you know, we're going to do this as practice for normal life. We're not trying to be competitors per se. We just want to use the competitive process as a practice. Well, we get there and say we're going to start shooting at 9. We'll get there around 7.30 or so. And we'll walk the whole course of fire for the day. And you can walk all around. You can see all the targets. You can step off the targets. You know exactly where everything is. You start to get a plan of when that buzzer goes off, where you're going to go and how you're going to handle it. And that's all well and good because that's there. But in the real world, if somebody comes up to rob you, you are not expecting to be robbed. So the level at which you're prepared to defend yourself from a robber is not the same as the level at which I'm prepared to defend myself against paper targets. I expect those targets to be there, so I handle them different. I'm, I'm ready. Even though I'm on minimal time, I know what to do because I had expected them. The same thing with fishing. Dude, I've been fishing for years. And anybody that fishes knows you've got a bad day and you're not catching fish. You end up putting a little piece of shrimp and you throw it out there and let it sit on the bottom and you stick it in a rod holder and you kick back and pull your hat down over, over your eyes and at that time you're not fishing, you're sun tanning. And you don't expect to catch fish. It's been four hours and you hadn't caught a fish yet. Your expectations aren't there. And you know what happens? That old rod will go wham! And you'll pick it up and you'll have so much slack in that line that you'll set the hook and it'll just fall over backwards in the boat and you miss the fish. You weren't expecting to catch a fish. If we want to come to church and we want to get a revelation from God, we've got to be expecting of that. We've got to show up here on a Sunday morning and say, God, I know you're going to say something to me today and I'm listening. So when it comes, I'm prepared. If I've got to write it down, if I've got to share it, I'm ready to get this revelation from you. See, that's what happens when people quit coming to church is they look to the pastor so, so often to fill them up with what they need. Dude, the Bible's only 66 chapters. I had a guy tell me, he said, I've heard every sermon that could possibly be preached be preached. He said, there's nothing new. That's right, there's not. You can't preach it in so many ways, but when we quit relying on a pastor to give us what we need, and we start hearing the voice of an almighty God that opens up truths of the church, and he says, I want to reveal this. It may not have said it. You may not have understood it, but this is a revelation. You won't be able to leave this church, much less not be fulfilled by being at this church. So number three, we can't come here with... The attitude of expecting a presentation. we got to come here receiving and expecting to receive a revelation. The fourth thing, see now my numbers got all screwed up and it's going to make me nervous because I'm highly obsessive compulsive. Um, it says three here, but it's really four. The fourth thing, to see to it that we get the most out of our time and our experience at church is we got to get involved. We can't just come. Coming to church is not enough. Getting involved and being the church is where we're going to see true fulfillment. I did, a, I did a little thing. See, I would do like Anthony did this morning, like David usually does uh, you know, on Sunday mornings at a previous church. I would, I would get up in the mornings and I would welcome people and I would sometimes share just a little bit about my week and what had happened and some little things that were um, going on. Maybe something the Lord showed me during the week. And I... I had an eye concept, I didn't really have the opportunity at that point to put it into a whole message about the reasons people are going to tell you if you invite them to church or when you're witnessing to people, why people will tell you they can't come. And I said, you know what I'll do is in my time in the mornings, I got probably, I don't know, as much as I want really, but as many weeks, I'll drag it out. And I did a little mini series, you know, so every week I spoke one topic about um, why people, the excuses people give you and what they try to tell you. And at one point, I got to one, and I've heard this, dude. I'm I've been in church, let's see, I'm probably, I'll be 34 this year maybe, and I, I had to go to church. I must have been four or five years old with my grandma, but so roughly 30 years I've spent in church. And, I, dude, I've heard them. I've been there. I've been in the workings of the church. I know what people say. And one thing that you, you hear a lot and that I've heard a lot is people will say, well, I just quit going to church because I wasn't getting fed anymore. You know what I say? Woo! 
Woo! Hallelujah! It's about time, brother! Because let me tell you what the Bible says. In, in Hebrews, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. I get so excited because it says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you. Again, the first principle of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is just a baby. But solid food belongs to those who are full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. He said, you ought to be able to feed yourself, guys. Grab a bite to eat. Quit coming to be fed. Church isn't a place. It's not a buffet. It's not like we're going to leave today and go to Ryan's or wherever you guys go after church and you sit down and you just keep getting, getting, getting. He said, by this time, you've been fed long enough. It's time for you to start doing feeding. So when people say, I'm not getting fed, I like to say, great, maybe it's time now that you can start doing the feeding. When you've reached that level with your walk with Jesus Christ that you don't have to come here on a Sunday morning and say, well, man, I really need something that, to just get me through to the week. When throughout the week you've been getting in that place with Jesus and you have something, we can step up. It says, for this time, you ought to be teachers. We don't need to be the ones. There's people out here that have never been to church. They're just getting saved maybe. They're new believers in Christ. That's what we're supposed to be doing, church. Church is for them. It's for us to lead them, to show them. For us is the... the the more uh, mature, as it says, the, the stronger the leaders um, in the church. You say, well, what can I do? How, how do I do this? How do I not just come, but how can I do something? Well, I'll tell you in Ephesians uh, chapter 4. Give me just a second. We'll get there. Ephesians chapter 4. There's, there was one word, and the way it put it, I really liked it. Verse 7 Let's see. All right, it talks about spiritual gifts. This is talking about what we can do as we've matured and we're no longer these ones that come needing to eat from somebody else's plate, but we're taking care of ourselves. And it says, To each one of you, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, he says, When he ascended on high, he led captive and gave gifts to men. What does it mean that he also first descended? Eh, that's not part of it. We'll go to 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry and edifying the body of Christ. But in verse 7, when we first got started, it says, but to each one of you. He didn't say some people got gifts and some of us just get to hang out and ride the wave or ride on the coattails of the rest of them. He said each one of you has been given a gift. We talk about that in the 301 class. Um, if you've not attended, that'd be a good place to start. What gift have you been given? You've been given a gift. If you were called into salvation, you were called to use your salvation for the body of Christ. It says it right here. Um, and you may not know what to do. That's fine. That's what we want to do as a church to help you. And 301 is a great place to start. I asked Justice last week um, if he could print us something up that, that shows these are the actual ministries. You know, I hear Lori all the time. She's always needing help with the kids and the kids' ministry. That's an opportunity. It's not hard to find them. But I asked Justice, I said, look, all the ministries. We've got children's ministry. We've got this ministry. Print them up. Put a contact information on there for somebody and let's start handing that out because the, the Word of God at no point in the Scripture does it lead us to believe that we should just hang out and be stagnant Christians. But it always comes back to showing us to be part of it, to get involved. That's what we had. Our number fourth was to get involved. How can we get involved in the church? And I said, Justice, maybe some people don't get involved because they just don't know. And we need to take out the... The I don't know factor. We need to let people know what they can do and get involved. You're never going to be happy, church. If all you do is attend church from now to the day you die, you'll be disgruntled when you die. You want to be part of something. People want to be part of something bigger than their self. You know, I mean, that's, that's the whole way this country was founded. You know, people said, you know, we got a bigger mission at hand and we want to be part. We believe in the mission and we're getting behind it and we're going to back the mission. Um, if you see something and you say, you know, I wish this church had X ministry. I feel like it, it really needs it. 
Maybe that's the Lord speaking to you about where your calling lies. Maybe that's what it is. If He persistently bugs you about a specific thing, explore your options as to what you can do in that thing. Let's be what we're lacking here at Bayou Tala. The fifth thing I'd want to share in resolving conflicts, I'm not going to tell you how many I got uh, because you might fall asleep or you might leave. I don't know. But the, the fifth thing, if you want to get the most out of your time at any church, at this church, at any church, is you've got to resolve conflicts. I have seen this, I'm telling you again, this is a thousand times. I've seen this as many times as I've had people tell me they don't get fed at church anymore. Um, if you have conflict with somebody in this church, Anthony and me got into an argument last week, let's just say, which it didn't happen, but say it did. And now I'm, I'm here at church and I'm sitting on my side, I'm over here watching him. And we're in worship service and instead of saying Jesus, I'm saying, mm hmm. Look at that sucker. He's over there praying. He's acting like ain't nothing. I know that sucker got me. He, he cheated me out of $20 or he did what? You're missing church, guys. So if you're going to come to church and you're going to harbor anger and resentment and you're going to have unresolved conflicts, that's just about as bad as not coming to church in the first place. You can't focus on what we're here to focus on when we're focused on the conflict that you have at hand. Um, in Matthew, there again, none of these are scriptures that you've never read. It's not like Old Testament genealogy. Um, it's all been, been talked about before. But Matthew chapter 18, there again, you don't have to go. I'll read it to you right quick. Verse 15 through 18. It gives us somewhat of a guideline of how we should handle uh, conflict amongst the saints. And that's, that's the thing about this. You know, obviously, if you have a conflict in the world, your situation may be a little bit different um, than the way you would handle that same conflict amongst somebody in the church. But in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18, uh, verses 15, I'm sorry, we'll start at 15. It says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, and now, of course, this is when you would have a, an anger or a conflict issue, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained a brother. I guess it's like the old playground bully situation when you whip the guy's tail, y'all are friends now, you know? So if you've got somebody that you feel like's done you wrong the majority of the time, they don't know they've done you wrong. They don't know how you feel. It says be a man. Walk up to a man to man or woman to woman and say, look, man, you said this. I took it this way. I'm sorry. I apologize. Or, or I feel like you should apologize or whatever the situation is. Um, and it says if they hear you, that's great. You got a friend for life. They'll have some respect for you, maybe. It says, but if he will not hear you, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So at that point, you say, look, I talked to him. He didn't feel it. Maybe that's time to get some of the, 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 the elders of the church or what have you. I mean, every conflict, of course, doesn't require this, but say, man, look, this is what happened. How, you know, let's talk about it. Let's sit down and make sure everything's right. Uh, make sure that we're on the same the same page that we all understood each other. It says, and if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be like a heathen and a tax collector. And Lord, if y'all heard me last time, I was talking about tax collectors. I, that Obviously, that's not something people look upon as highly favorable, you know, but it, it gives us this idea in that passage that we do have a need to get rid of these these conflicts that come up between us, these things that cause strife between us in the body. And it tells us, look, go to that person. Then go to the leadership. It even goes as far as saying, look, if they've done something that's completely sinful and, and unrepentedly sinful, we need to bring it before the church and say, look, dude, you were wrong. We've discussed it amongst the leadership and what you did was a, not a proper thing. You, maybe you cheated on your wife. Maybe you, well, I don't know what it may be, but you have no desire to repent of your sin. At that point, we just got to say, dude, we got to be done. I mean, but it, it gives multiple opportunities. That passage says, look, try. It gives three different methods of trying to resolve that conflict. And I'm going to tell you, church, if we go into to ever experience church, the fullness of church, this is a key factor. We have to resolve conflicts. And like I said, the, the majority of the time, it eats with us. I saw a girl on Facebook over the weekend. I don't even know the girl. I don't know how... Um, how I don't know. That's a crazy situation how that Facebook works. Um, but somehow she was on there and she was talking about all this resentment she has to this guy. And, uh, you know, that, that dude probably living his life just fine. 
he's probably happy as can be. He wakes, every, wakes up every morning and has pep in his step. And yet you're going to let that hold you back because you don't want to resolve that conflict. You know, I've said it a ton of times. I've heard it said tons of times. People say, you don't know what that person did to me. You know, I, I know it's, it's a, in my family, I've seen this. You know, we're talking about generational curses. And I saw my grandfather leave a church because he felt somebody wronged him. And my dad thought he was silly for that. But many years later, my dad left the church because he felt like somebody wronged him. And I see this coming down the line is, is that's what they do. They get offended. And I say, that's it. I'm done. Uh, I don't want any more part of that. And we've got to get to a point where we realize, yeah, that person did pretty bad. What they did was wrong. But we can forgive much when we realize that we've been forgiven much. Did you hear me, church? If you knew what you did, the things that you did, the things that I did, the things that I still do every day that break the heart of Jesus Christ. And he said, that's far as the east is from the west. I forgot about it. He said, I told a buddy of mine, we went fishing maybe two weekends ago, and we were talking about it. He's got a new baby. And I, I told him, I said, dude, it's crazy how that little rascal will be able to tell you something, and you will want to choke the life out of him. And five minutes later, they're going to come sit beside you and you, you don't even know what they did. You completely forgot. That's what it's like, church. That's what the love of Jesus Christ is like in our life. It's, it's not that He just puts our sins over here on the side and He forgets them, or, or can pull them back out and say, hey, look, remember you did this and this. He said as far as the east is from the west, it's done. And that's the way we've got to learn to become to get the most out of our experiences. Learn, yeah, you know, look, I may not position myself in a way to let you do that to me again, but I'm going to let that one go because I know there's a bigger, uh, a bigger picture here being painted, something more than me, and I want to be involved in it, and I want to get the most out of that involvement. So resolve, resolve our conflicts. The sixth thing we need to do if we want to see that we get the absolute most out of our church experience is that we need to build quality relationships. I, I, when I put this down, I got to thinking about relationships and what the Scripture says about relationships and the first thing that came to my mind was in the book of Genesis. You've got the whole first chapter of Genesis. There's a void abyss, nothing there. And God starts speaking into this abyss. He speaks life into this abyss. And He says, earth, stars, planets, water, the, all these things. I want to put animals here and I want to do this and I want to do that. And He does all these things and it said He took dust and He breathed life into it and He made a man and He rested. And there's theories as to how long these days were and such, but I'm going to take it for what it is. He said he's going, boom, he's making one thing after another thing he's producing. It said he made man in his own image, and then he rested. And immediately, when you pick up in chapter 2, it says, and God said, for it is not good for man to be alone. It doesn't say that after he made man, that all these things happened and the, the Adam went around. He was, he was good. He, I mean, he had it made in the shade. You know, he's living in the Garden of Eden. It wasn't good. He said he was alone. It's not good for man to be alone. So that's when the Lord took the rib from the man and he made Eve for him, made a companion for him to have um, because he saw that it was not good. The very beginning, the scripture that we read from the second chapter, or the second book, First book, second chapter, I apologize. It starts giving us this concept of not living life on our own, but yet living life with community of believers. The people around you to have relationships with those people. Not just come to you and shake their hand and say, okay, uh, I know your first name, but to have quality relationships to where those people are walking through life with you. Um, <clears throat> go to a Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes, that's going to be far to your left. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. I remember from way back when I was in children's ministry, geez, 20 years ago, they had a, a, a song. It was a guy called Rappin' Rabbit. I don't know, you guys might not be that old or may not have been in that type of church, but it was this little rabbit figure and he would rap and he taught me the books of the Bible and every time I replay them in my head, it's like to just rap beat. It's kind of a weird thing, but hey, it is what it is, guys. Yeah, I might. We'll have that for the next time. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, starting in verse 9. It says, the value of a friend. This was uh, uh, Solomon, I believe. Solomon, and he was speaking of all the things that had happened to him. And he just, at this point in his life, he felt... Like he was just alone. And he says this, this section of this chapter has, talks about the value of having a friend. He says two are better than one 
because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold accord is not quickly broken. So he gives us this concept that it's, bad things are going to happen to us, folks. That's just all it boils down to. I, that's why I'm not a big fan of the health and wealth and prosperity gospel because it's, it's garbage. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that once you come to the knowledge and the fullness of Christ, that life is a cakewalk from that point on. It just doesn't say. It. It's going to be hard. We're going to have struggles. We're going to fall. There's going to be things happening in our family. There's going to be things happen at work. There's going to be conflicts. It says there's no reason to be, be alone. It says so if you fail, you have someone to pick you up. You know, that, that's the, the, the point of having this body of believers gather here. We're by Utala Fellowship. We're not here just to come in on Sunday morning and shake hands, but to, to live life together because it's not good for us to be alone. You know, to, to be able to say this person's in the bind, let's gather together and let's rally behind them and help them to get from where they're at to where they ought to or where they want to be. Um, and we, we, me and Justice have talked about this, and hopefully what we would like to do in the near future is start more small groups. We, we really believe it says that in the, the first page of the little booklet of stuff he printed out for it, and we've said it dozens of times. I've heard him say it. For us to get bigger, we got to start by getting smaller. You can't have a church of a 1,000 people that only come on Sunday mornings and we all leave. They're going to leave everyone and be leaving unfulfilled. You're not getting anything out of it. There's no way that what we do here on Sunday morning is enough to keep somebody walking in a proper, uh, proper walk with Jesus Christ. So we feel like we got to small things down a little bit to size them down. Uh, and that's something to consider. If, like we talked about getting involved. If you want to get involved, if you feel like the Lord's gave you something, I told Justice, like, not just strictly ministry related, which obviously that's the end goal of it. But I, I like to garden. I really enjoy it. And I thought about potentially having a group for people to get together and we can talk about plants and we can garden, we can grow things, you know, and of course we'll talk about the Lord. But if you have something that you see uh, as, a, as a hobby or a skill, or maybe there are, you know, some people like to study the book of Revelation real in depth. I really don't care too much about that. But if you like it, maybe you could be in charge of that small group and you would get people that have similar interests to you, or you could gather together on a weekly basis, you meet, and you begin to build that community that is so vital to your growth uh, and, and your, uh, your time at church. So I would encourage you, if that's something you think, hey, I, I could see myself, I, I don't really want to stand up in front of 100 people, 120 people, and try to present a message on a Sunday morning, but man, if I had five people in my group, I really think I might could lead them a little bit better uh, on the path towards Christ. So get with me about that. Get with justice about that. We have things now, three or four groups that are regularly meeting, and that may be perfect. Those groups may be exactly where you fit in, and that may be exactly what you need to give you that sense of community. But if it's not, we want to do a better job of it here. We want, to, we want to do everything and give you every opportunity we can to help you succeed in your walk with Jesus Christ. Um, me and my wife, she mentioned this to me well, maybe this week, actually. I didn't say a word about it, but I knew that this was part of what I was speaking on. And she said, you know, since we've been here, I expect we've been here close to a year now, probably a year. She said, we just really hadn't built any relationships at church. And I didn't say a word, but she's right. We haven't. It's not your fault. You know whose fault it is? It's our fault. You know, last week when you guys had a meal, we didn't stay. When you had groups that we were invited to, we didn't come. So if we want to have these relationships... It's so easy. It'd be very easy for me to say, that's a bunch of rude people over there. I just can't be a part of them. That's not the case. You're some of the nicest people I've ever met. But if I don't put forth the effort to reach out and meet you in the middle to shake your hand to build these relationships, it's not going to happen. And I can't fault anybody in this church except myself for that. And I would encourage you to do the same. If you say, you know what, I, I just feel like I'm kind of disconnected from people. I don't feel, look, look where the problem's coming from. Is it from the people? Or is it from the individual that has that feeling? I, I found out real quick where mine's from. It's me. I'm the problem. I'm the culprit, and I need to change that. So I would encourage you to work on that. If, if you call this your church home, start working towards building relationships in this body. Um, 
the, the next one we're going to look at, invest in the church. I, I Googled it, and I don't even have my phone on me, but the first thing that popped up was in, invest, and it had a definition. It had two parts. The first one said, expend money with expectation of achieving a profit by putting it into a financial scheme, a share, or property. The first one. That's investing as we would typically think. And it's this, this concept of we give money, we put money into the stock market, the stock market grows, we take out money, and we make a profit. Probably a good majority of us do things like that. And that's not all that different than what we do here. When the plate comes, we're investing. We're not just giving money and throwing dollar bills away. If you walk down the road and throw them out the window, that's a little different. But we're investing, and we're trusting that the church takes this money and uses this money to, to bring the community and to reach people, to get them saved and to teach them Jesus Christ. So that idea of investing kind of goes to, to the same concept as tithing to your church. We can invest. We, can, we expect gains when we give money. We expect to see souls saved and people brought to Jesus Christ by the money that we gave. So that's your typical form of investing. And then the second definition it has for you, it says provide or endow something with. When I read that, I say, okay, provide. what can I endow this church with? It goes back to what our gift is. We can invest in this church in more ways than dollar bills. We can invest our time in this church. We can invest our gifts into this church. We can endow this church with what we have to offer. If you have something that you say, you know, there again, like we just said, the church needs, invest yourself into that area, into that ministry. And we expect gains. That's the whole concept. If you just do something... And then you just leave, well, nothing happened. But if you do it, you say, I'm expecting that by my time being put into this, or my money, or my skill, or my ability, or my knowledge, that I can see somebody come from where they are to where Jesus Christ wants them to be. Um, that's an investment. In Matthew chapter 6, Verse, uh, we'll start in verse 19. It'll be real quick, just a few. Chapter 6, verse 19. It says, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust can destroy them and where thieves can break in and steal. We, we live in a decent neighborhood. You know, I, we moved from a not so decent neighborhood when we had our son to a more decent neighborhood for the idea of protecting him. We wanted to do right by our kid and give him an opportunity. And maybe a month ago, some hood rat came through the woods and broke, well, they didn't break in. We didn't have our cars locked, but they stole some things out of my truck, stole some things out of my wife's. And it says, do not lay up for your, yourself treasure on earth where moths can destroy them and thieves can steal them. That's what I did. My treasure was stole. It said, but lay up for yourself treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And the last time I spoke with you guys, I told you that there was a passage of Scripture that I always read backwards and I understood it backwards. And I finally came to understand it as it was written on the page. And this is the same thing. I came up my whole life thinking this Scripture said more of the, of the effect of for where your heart is, there your treasure will be. But in fact, that's not what it says. It says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, if you invest and you got money and you've got time and you invest it into this church, that draws you into it. I remember the first time I put any money into the stock market, like a $100 bill. I thought I was high rollers. I'm going to put this $100 in the stock so I can retire when I'm 55 years old. And every day I'd get up and I'd go look at that stock and say, I'm a rich, I'm a rich. And I never got rich and I probably lost that $100 by now. But the fact of the matter is my treasure, that $100 that I worked hard for, my treasure was there. So my heart got there real quick. If your heart's not for this church and you say, man, I'd love to have more of a heart for the people of God, more of a heart for the ministry that's going on at Bayou Tala, but you don't, I'd say invest in it. Put your money here. Put your time here. Where your treasure is, your heart will surely follow. It's the last one we're going to look at. It'd be number eight. I figure eight's a good number and it's getting that time. Um, to take ownership of this church. If you want to get the most out of this church, you need to take ownership in it. You say, well, that's odd. I'm not a, a deacon. I'm not an elder. I'm not a guy that can stand up there on the front of the stage and, um, and, and preach on a Sunday morning. I'm just a little old me. How can I take ownership in this church? Well, let me tell you this morning, guys, this is your church. Amen. Justice Froman doesn't own this church. We love him as a pastor. He does a great job, but it's not the only one. It's not just about him. It's about us. 
you don't, don't bother following, but I want to show you this concept. I'm going to read these real quick, kind of a, 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 list, a list through a lot of the uh, letters that were written to the churches. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, uh, to the church of God that is at Corinth, this is 1 Corinthians, to those who are sanctified in Jesus Christ, called to be saints with all who are in every place called in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, keep that in mind. We'll go to 2 Corinthians to the beginning. The first part of 2 Corinthians says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy our brother to the church of God which is at Corinth, which all the saints who are in Achaia, keep that in mind, all the saints. Galatians, it starts out the same way. It says, Paul, an apostle, uh, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him uh, and all the brethren who are with me. Galatians, uh, Ephesians, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to all the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Jesus Christ, grace be with you to all the saints. So we looked at uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. The first part of Philippians says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. It goes on. You can read all the letters that Paul wrote to all the churches and every one of them starts the same way. He addresses the leaders, the elders, and he says all the saints. Because Paul had this concept of what the modern church after Jesus was to look like where everybody was involved. Where people took ownership in their church. Where this church meant something to them. To, to the church at Ecclesia and the church at Philippi that everybody had a part of it. You know, I, I had a guy that he talked about this one time. You know, you'll see a piece of trash and you're walking up through the, the parking lot and there's a cup that fell out of somebody's car and we'll pass by it so many times and say, man, somebody on this grounds crew ought to pick that cup up. No, we ought to pick it up. We ought to take ownership in this place. We ought to treat this place like we're the one paying the note on it. We ought to treat this place like it's our house, like it's our future invested in it. I cut my grass regular. I stay on top of maintenance at my house regular because I take ownership in my house. But if I step back and look at it, do I take ownership in my church? Do I take ownership in the, the things that happen at this church? I had a guy, uh, a preacher friend of mine, church we had, came from, we spent several years there with him, and he had the best way of of kind of wrapping all this up and making it make sense. And he, he said, we treat church like a family meal. He said, for us to understand that, say we get together, our two of us, couples, whatever, we're going to go out to eat somewhere and we're going to this really fancy restaurant. You had to have reservations months ahead of time. So we had months to think about this and we knew exactly what we wanted to get off the menu and we showed up and we ordered our food, we ordered our drink and we sat down and that steak that we precisely ordered to be medium well either comes out medium or it comes out well. And that's not exactly what we wanted. You know what we're going to do? We're going to take that plate and we're going to push it to the edge of the table and we're going to say, guys, uh, it's not what I wanted. That's our expectation of that. But he said, you go to your house and your wife throws some hamburgers on the grill and this has happened to me and my wife both ways. One of us will be cooking out. You come in, you bring it in and um, that hamburger you bit into wasn't just how you liked it. Dare not push that hamburger out to the side of the table and say, honey, go cook this a little more. You get your butt up and go to the grill and throw that hamburger patty back over that fire. See, it comes to this idea that, that in, a, in a community, in a church, that it's not about everybody just catering to us. It's about this part of involvement. How can we be involved? How can we do our part? We've got to learn to treat the church like it's this family meal that when we see something that's not exactly like we thought, that we change it. Don't, they don't need to bother somebody else about it. I, look, if there's, if there's dirt on the floor at my house, I'm not going to bother somebody. I'm going to get the vacuum. I'm going to vacuum it up. I, I take ownership in it. We need to take that same type of ownership in this church. Um, I'll close by saying this. This concept, I say, you know, I, I looked at it as how we can get the most out of our church experience. And these same steps apply to everything in life. They, they apply to how can we get the most out of our marriage? How can we get the most out of our job? How can we get the most out of friendships we have? They, they all are the same. It all boils down to this one central concept that anything in life we want to get the most out of will only get the most out of it or will, will only get as much out of it as we're willing to put into it. If, if you're here this morning and you say, you know, 
I, I just, I'm, I'm not getting anything. I don't think this is the church for me. The next church probably won't be the place for you either. If you're not willing to put in the work here, you're not going to be willing to put in the work there, you'll never be satisfied. You'll go to the grave saying, if I'd just found the proper church for me. If you're here and you're a member of this church, instead of looking for another church, I would encourage you to put in your effort and devote yourself to this church and see if it changed. Devote yourself to the things in your life. Put forth the maximum amount of effort and see that you get the maximum amount of return on that. Um, so I hope this morning that we can, we can look at these things when we go home. Do some of you folks, y'all may have it all worked out. And you say, man, I just couldn't be happier. A- and me included. Some of us look at some things and we say, oh, I wish it was different. I wish I, I had this or I wish I had that. And I would encourage you to think back over these eight things and see if, are you doing all eight? Is there something you could do better? Are there things I could do better? Of course there are. I told you, flat. I mean, I, straight up, I told you what my problem is. Is there anything holding you back? from getting the absolute most? Are you not putting in a full effort and a full potential to this body? So what we're going to do this morning, um, we're going to ask the prayer guys to come forward. We're going to give you an opportunity. If you need somebody to pray with you this morning, that'll be afforded to you here. If not, we'll just quietly dismiss and we can go on uh, about our business, about doing what we do on a Sunday. I'm going to pray and close us, but they will be here for you. If, If there's something, like we said, if if there's unforgiveness and you harbor an anger and you really need to get that right, don't leave, guys. I would encourage you not to leave. If you're looking at that person right now, like I said, you got those arms crossed and you say, hmm, that sucker there got me. I would encourage you. This is the time. That's why we offer this time at the end of the service for us to think back on what's going on and, um, and to kind of reflect on what we heard and, and see um, if we need to make any changes in our life. And for revelation, we're talking about seeking revelation. This is a good time just for the next few minutes that you know, we can really sit here in some quiet and just really focus on the Lord and see if He has anything for us. So let me close this out. If you have to leave, feel free. Lord, I thank You for the opportunity that You give us to stand here, to hear Your Word, to come here on Sunday morning. Father, that's an opportunity not afforded to so many in this world. I thank You that You speak to us, God. That's the most amazing thing, that the God that can create the universe in a matter of days just by speaking it will speak to us. Lord, I thank You so much for that. Thank You that You care for us enough to do that. Father, I just ask You that You'll speak to our hearts, Lord, that You'll show us what we can do, that You'll show us how to become a part of this church, show us how to get tied in and connected with this church, Lord, so we can not boast and not grow members and those things, Lord, that we can do it to grow closer to You. We thank you so much that you were able to bring us here. Thank you for our health, Lord. We're just so grateful for all you see to do for us. Lord, we ask all these things and we give all the thanks to you in Jesus' name. Amen.